Welcome. I'm Daughter of Darkness. Tonight, I'll be telling you stories of spirits, doppelgangers, and shadow people that make it a point to scare young children. Be sure to join me here every Thursday at 5 p.m. for new content. And if you like the video, give it a thumbs up and comment below. That's a direct request from the Great Gods of YouTube. They need these things to survive. Who knew? But for now, sit back, relax, let me lead the way. And let's get scared together, 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 together. Between the ages of 9 and 14, I lived in a haunted home with my brother and father. My dad gained custody of my brother and I when I was 7 and my brother 4. For a while we lived in a small two-bedroom home. I hated having to share a room with my brother, so when my dad told me that our landlord had bought a much bigger three-bedroom home down the road and was willing to rent to us, I was thrilled. Dad worked as a prison guard, so he wasn't home during the hours of 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. We had a babysitter until I was around 12. After that, though, we were on our own. We got ready for school and fed ourselves. This wasn't a problem, because I knew how to cook and keep house, so we mostly had a very good relationship with our dad. I will note, though, that he was an annoyingly skeptical man at this point in his life. I remember when we first toured the house. I barely paid attention to most of it, just fought with my brother over who got the bigger room. I had absolutely no reason to be upset, but then, out of the blue, I suddenly felt that there was something off about the place. I told my dad the house didn't feel right to me. He told me it was probably because it was hot in the house, and I accepted that because I didn't want to think about it anymore. I wanted to be excited about the new house. We moved in about a week or so after that, and for a while, everything was fine. My room felt welcoming and cozy. Nothing bad happened for a couple of months. At most, I saw some movement out of the corner of my eye, but such things were very easy to dismiss. The one thing that really bothered me, though, was the basement. It was like a concrete cave, it had low ceilings and a deep, dark storage room where we kept all of our Christmas and Halloween decorations. The main area had our washer and dryer and a bunch of my dad's driftwood art projects. But that basement made me feel sick, like I had a deep pit of dread in my stomach that wouldn't go away until I got back upstairs. Of course, the laundry was my job, so I would make my trips down there as quick as possible and then get out of there. It all started with the voices. They were quiet at first, but eventually I would be startled awake by random screams that nobody else seemed to be able to hear. Heavy footsteps and banging outside my bedroom door were next, and that became common. My bedroom was at the center of the house, off the computer room. My dad's was on one side by the kitchen, and my brother's on the other by the living room, so we weren't exactly close to one another. Soon after all this started, however, my brother began sleeping in my dad's room with him, so something must have been bothering him, too. The activity was constant for a while, with things getting knocked over, noises at night, and a general eerie feeling. It began escalating one night when I had my friends over. My dad was at a neighbor's house playing poker, and my friends and I were listening to music. Suddenly, one of my friends said, Wait, who's that? We all turned to look where she was pointing, at the TV set. All of us were sitting around a table and we could see a reflection in the large TV screen. But there was somebody else being reflected there, besides us. The image of a man sitting on the couch behind us. We were stunned. We kept looking back and forth from the empty couch to the TV screen. My friend stood up. And then, we all watched in horror as the mystery figure on the screen slowly turned to look at her. We screamed and ran outside. I ran down the street to get my dad to come home. But when he did, he insisted that we had just scared ourselves, nothing more. As time went on, things in the house got worse. I developed insomnia, and I started getting paranoid. 
I became depressed and refused to get out of bed some days. I started feeling weak and like I just wasn't fully present with the others. As my mental state went downhill, this opened a door for the spirits and they moved in closer to me, and I began to see them. At times, a tall shadow man would creak open my door at night and stare at me, and I would hear what sounded like a woman softly crying underneath my bed. There was also a man with a burnt face who used to hide in dark corners in the basement. I could hear his raspy breathing long before I saw him. It felt like I was living in a nightmarish version of a Dr. Seuss book, and my father refused to acknowledge any of it. One day, I was walking through the computer room, and I felt like I ran into somebody's open hand. The fingers wrapped around my neck and began to squeeze. I stumbled backwards and just stood there, holding my neck in shock. Later, I began to cough up small amounts of blood. This concerned my father, and he took me to the ER. The doctor shined a light down my throat, and he said I had several tiny lacerations in the back of my esophagus. He asked me if I had accidentally eaten some metal or glass. I was sure I hadn't. And a couple of months after that, I woke up spitting up blood again, and the same lacerations were found in my esophagus. This even happened to a friend of mine when she spent the night. To this day, I still can't find a rational explanation to explain these injuries. I feel my breaking point with this house came when I went to retrieve the laundry from the basement one day. I was almost up the stairs when I felt a cold hand wrap around my ankle, and then I was violently yanked screaming down the concrete stairs. This ripped a huge patch of skin off the front of my leg and left my cheek and elbow bleeding. As I hit the basement floor, I heard raspy laughter, mocking and cruel. I ran upstairs sobbing, begging my dad to find another place and move, pleading with him to please believe me but he simply insisted that I just lost my footing as he tended to my wounds. And that was the last he wanted to hear about it. Determined to prove to him that the house was haunted, I made a pair of dowsing rods. For anyone who doesn't know, dowsing rods are bent metal rods that you hold in your hands and they rotate when you come into contact with magnetic energy. They were once used to find water underground but you can also use them to detect spirits. I made the rods out of wire coat hangers. My dad watched, amused, as I walked around the computer room with the rods in my hand. As I got closer to the shelf that held my father's precious moments figurines, the rods began to aggressively move towards me. Then, if I would step away, they'd move away from me. Does that mean they're full of water, my dad asked, mocking me? Just as he said that, it looked as if an invisible arm swept along the shelf and threw every single one of those figurines against the wall. Dad's face dropped. After that, the spirits started stalking my dad, too. They now knew he believed in them, so there was no point any longer in hiding. My dad told me that the shadow man would stand outside his room at night and watch him for hours. He couldn't sleep anymore, and he almost lost his job. We moved out soon after that. As the years went by, I saw many families move in then out of that house. No one stays there for long. I had the opportunity a few years ago to tour the place, as it was up for rent again. Walking from room to room, it was clear to me that the bad energy was still there, dark and heavy as ever. I asked the new landlord in the most gentle way if previous tenants had said anything about the activity. He was surprised by the question and told me that he didn't know as he had just recently bought the property. We ended up talking for a while and I gave him the best heads up that I could. He seemed more intrigued than upset. I hope he keeps that enthusiasm. I did not rent the house and have put it and its less than pleasant memories in the past. One thing I'm thankful for, though, is the endurance I developed while living there. I'm no longer afraid of ghosts. I've been yelled at, intimidated by, and hurt by them. I've seen them at their worst. So now, instead of cowering, 
I thrive in paranormal locations. I actually enjoy them. Many spirits just want to be acknowledged and understood. But some want to pull you down the stairs. Just like people, they can't all be winners. That house helped me to be brave and face my fears. It made my dad a believer, and it gave us all a lot of stories to tell. So I guess I'm grateful for the experience, even though ultimately it was a negative one. It helped mold me into the strange person that I am today. I'm from Thailand, and my parents and I lived for just two months in an apartment when I was 11 years old. Back then, my father worked in the evening, so he wasn't home until late. Mom taught at the local preschool, so she was always home by 1 p.m. That was the time that I got home from school. One day after school, I came home and called out for my mother, but got no reply. I went to her bedroom and found her sleeping. I figured she must be tired, and I didn't want to bother her, so I made myself a snack. After eating, I went to her room and lay down next to her. She woke up and, without speaking, started stroking my hair until I fell asleep. Thirty minutes later, I heard the doorbell ring. I woke up and saw that my mother was no longer in bed, so I got up to answer the door. When I opened the door, I saw my mother still in her work clothes. I was confused as she frantically started apologizing for coming home late, and she asked me if I'd eaten yet. I told her that yes, I'd had a snack, but I didn't say anything to her at all about the incident with the doppelganger. A few days passed and it was Saturday. Both of my parents were home, so we planned to go to the park and have a picnic. I jumped in the shower to get ready. While I was taking my shower, I heard the bathroom door open. I couldn't see who it was, but I heard my mother's voice. She put a towel next to the shower for me, and I got a glimpse of her hand. Then she said that we weren't going on the picnic any longer. I finished my shower and came out of the bathroom upset. I asked my mom why she canceled the picnic, and she said, Who told you that? And I said, You did, and I told her what happened. Now she was the one confused, and she said that she hadn't come in the bathroom at all and had no idea what I was talking about. After that, I'd hear movement in the apartment and a woman humming a tune in my mother's voice. But I knew it wasn't my mom, because she wasn't home when I'd hear it. Luckily, we didn't live there for long. We moved about a month later, though I still heard the humming from time to time even after we moved. This wasn't my last encounter with the paranormal. I've had many of them. I finally decided enough was enough, and I went to see a priest last year to get some help. I feel safer now than I have in a long time. When I was 17, I finally told my mom about the doppelganger of her, and she told me that the reason we moved so fast from that apartment was that she and my father were getting scared, and she wished I would have told her sooner. From what I heard, the family that moved in after us didn't have a good time of it either. The building has since been torn down. And here are some replies from the comments section. I had a similar experience happen when I was very young, around four. My brother was a baby, and very early one morning he started to cry. My parents were both in bed asleep, and I couldn't wake them, so I decided to check on the baby myself. As I got to the doorway of the baby's room, I saw a woman with her back to me. She was dressed in my mother's robe, and had what looked like my mother's hairstyle. This woman was standing right by the crib, holding and soothing my brother as he cried. I thought I was seeing things, so I went to check, and my mom was still in bed. I woke her up and dragged her back to my brother's room, and when we got there, he was sitting in his crib, happily gurgling at us, completely alone. Now this right here is the reason you should always have doppelganger protocol. I'm kidding, but my mom and I have joked about this before. I said if we ever really believed that the other one was a double, 
to ask specific questions that answer the question within the question, only the information is incorrect. Such as, do you want your favorite pineapple pizza from Domino's tonight? The truth is, I hate both pineapple and Domino's. So if the fake double says yes, well, right there you know you got yourself a fight or flight situation. I have something like that with my parents, except for me the trick question is, do you want a pickle on your hamburger? I hate pickles. If the double answers yes, then my parents ask a few more questions. And if those replies are also wrong, then they pretend to go for a walk, but really call the police. And if I think my parents are the doppelgangers, my question is, can I go skateboarding? I don't own a skateboard. And if they say yes, then it's like, see ya, and I go call the police. My name is Brett, and I grew up in Akron, Ohio, and currently live in Georgia. As a kid, our homes were plagued with terror. My older brother, Joe, and I saw and heard things which lead me to believe that true evil does exist. A child is truly innocent, and if there are forces out there that malevolent in the world that they terrorize children, surely they must be the embodiment of evil. In 1985, we lived in a house that frightens me to this very day. Things that took place within those walls terrorized our family the entire time we lived there. One such event we called the Black Cassandra, because as kids we didn't know to call it a shadow figure. My mother's name was Cassandra, and it had her basic shape, so we named it after her. My older brother Joe Jr. was seven at the time, and I was five. One night, my mom was babysitting our cousins, and they were sharing the bedroom with Joe and me. After a long day of playing, we had dinner and were put to bed. During the night, Joe woke up and nudged me, asking if I was awake. I said yes. We could hear Madonna music being played downstairs, our mother's favorite. She always played music when she cleaned the house, which she often did late at night when my father was out. Our cousins were asleep on the other side of the room, so Joe whispered, Let's go downstairs and be with Mom. I agreed, so we slowly got up and made our way to the bedroom door, careful not to wake up the others. Ever afraid of the dark, we held hands as we made our way to the bedroom door. We opened it and noticed that someone was across the hall in my mom's room, sitting on the floor. The hair on the back of my neck stood up, and a sensation of fear that's hard to articulate came over me as we stared into the room across the hall. What must have been only a few seconds seemed to stretch into infinity as our eyes tried to focus in the dark, and our brains tried to understand what we were seeing. All the lights were off upstairs, so the only light we had was a dim stream coming from the stairway at the end of the hall. Mom's room was pitch black, but something was sitting right there, right in front of us. And it was so black, it stood out from the surrounding darkness. It was sitting Indian style on the floor, and it had the basic silhouette of our mom. Its head was looking down, but then it suddenly looked up, right at us. Fear hit us like a lightning bolt, and my older brother let go of my hand and took off without me. Needless to say, I was right behind him, and we flew down the stairs to our mom. As we reached the landing, screaming and crying, our mom came over, angry that we were making so much noise. She said, What the heck are y'all doing making that noise? You're gonna get it. Now that there was spanking talk. We continued to cry, and she sat us on the sofa and told us to calm down. We tried to tell her what happened. As we started to explain, her eyes widened and she hugged us close and told us everything would be okay. Mom said a few prayers with us, and then she brought out some paper and pencils, and she told us to draw what we saw in her room. I told her that the pencil wasn't dark enough to draw the thing that we saw. We were terrified, but she thought of a plan to calm us down. 
Mom used her secret weapon. She gave us each some licorice. We gobbled down the candy, and for a moment, we forgot about the menace waiting for us upstairs. After 20 minutes, Mom had enough. It was well past midnight, and we needed to go to bed. Okay, it's time to go back upstairs, Mom said. Our eyes got wide, and the tears came down again, as we realized she wanted us to go back upstairs alone. Mom, please come with us, Joe begged. I just kept on crying. Mom started to raise her voice and began her well-known, well-respected count to three. For the uninitiated, that means if she got to three and we hadn't done as she asked, the belt would start swinging and butts would start hurting. One, Mom said as she went around the corner to grab the belt. We moved a little closer to the bottom of the stairs. Two, she said as she rounded the corner of the dining room, belt in hand. Three, and she came towards us with the belt held up. In defeat, we started our journey back upstairs, under extreme duress. Joe took my hand, and we slowly crept up the stairs, still aware of what awaited us around the corner. Being in front, Joe had a better vantage point, and he could see what was there. And once he saw it, he let go of my hand and once again abandoned me and started running. Joe was a pathetic older brother. I still tease him about it to this day. I panicked and scampered after him. I saw Joe's back as he leapt into the darkness of our room. But as I entered the room, the door slammed on me, hitting me in the face, knocking my head against the corner of the door jamb. I screamed in pain and lay on the floor in terror. Our cousins woke up when they heard the noise, and Mom ran upstairs to comfort me. That house terrorized us for the entire time we lived there, and I'm happy to say we're now out of its grip. Whenever I go home, I take my wife and children to look at the old house, and I've even knocked on the door to see if the entity is still there. But no one answers the door, so I still don't know. Someone ought to take a belt to these ghosts for deliberately scaring kids. Maybe the next time you're bothered by an unfriendly spirit, you should tell them if they don't go away by the time you count to three, they'll be hell to pay. Literally. I'd like to thank every one of you for choosing to spend some of your Thursday with me. Giving me your time is truly the best gift you could ever give, and it's very much appreciated. So, until next time... Stay scared, my friends. <laughs>